We ready? Okay. Good morning, Javier Becerra, Chairman of the House Democratic Caucus, joined by my colleague uh, from New York, Mr. Joe Crowley, who is the Vice Chairman of the Democratic Caucus. We had a good meeting where we discussed principally the President's remarks yesterday in the State of the Union. I think most of us were not only thrilled to hear that the President will focus on the middle of America and make sure that our economics are focused on the middle of America, as the President called it, middle class economics, but that he laid out specific proposals as how we make sure that the driving force for our economic, economic uh, return, the middle class, will now get to see even more benefit. Because while everyone has seen some benefit and the American public is beginning to talk about how we're back, we know that there's still folks who haven't felt that prosperity the way others have. Uh, great to know we've had 11 million jobs created more than 58 consecutive months of job creation. That's a record. Our country has never seen that. We are watching gas prices continue to fall. Who could complain about that? Uh, more high school students graduating than ever, more of our children going on to college than ever. That stands in stark contrast to where we were right after the Wall Street burnout that caused the biggest recession our country has faced since the Great Depression in the 1930s. And so we were pleased to hear that the president says community colleges, they should be tuition free for all those young Americans who want to go to college and for all their parents who are finding it hard to afford to send their kids to college. We're pleased that the president is saying we should not be the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't offer paid sick leave to its employees. Critical to know that you don't have to worry about uh, being too ill to work, but you can't afford to not go, or having a child who's very sick, and you can't afford to miss work when your child should be at home. And so we're pleased about that. And the president talked about making sure our tax policies, that tax code that so many families fear, works for them, not against them, and that everyone contributes to paying their taxes, not just those who earn a paycheck. And so at the end of the day, I think the president made it very clear. It's about putting the middle class paycheck earning Americans first, not last when we think about policy here in Washington, D.C. Uh, Washington, D.C. should not be in its own bubble, and we have to make sure that we're heeding what's going on. We've seen the economy, the GDP, grow by about 12% in recent years. We've watched as Wall Street has had increases of close to 100%, corporate profits up over 40%. Paychecks, they really haven't grown. For those who earn a paycheck, they're making about the same amount as they were before the economic recovery started. And so that's the missing link, making sure that working middle class Americans actually see their paycheck grow. And we are here to say that the president hit it out of the park in talking about how middle class Americans who work very hard and earn a paycheck should come first, not those who've got a special interest, not those who can afford a lobbyist. We should work on making sure the middle class comes first. Uh, there are all, all, all sorts of opportunities for us to move forward. We hope that we'll actually move towards coming together bipartisanly to get some of that done. Let's hope that the President's State of the Union helps launch that effort here in Congress now. With that, let me yield to my colleague and friend, Joe Crowley. Uh, I'll just thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just, uh, I'll just add to that. Uh, the President's focus obviously was on the continuing growth of our economy adding to uh, the positive growth that we've seen that the chairman has laid out in terms of 58 straight months of consecutive private sector job growth, 11 million jobs being created uh, during his term in office, uh, and all the benefits aside from uh, lowering gas prices, the effect that that will have uh, in other ways in terms of food prices, et cetera, that will um, hopefully be impacted by that. Uh, but that uh, we do need to do more to uh, stabilize and to strengthen and to grow the middle class. And that was clearly the focus that the President um, put forward yesterday, uh, talking about the need to find a way uh, forward to help uh, families struggling to make ends meet, mothers and fathers both working, uh, to make childcare more affordable uh, in this country, uh, pointing out that it costs more to send uh, one of their older children uh, to a state school than, it, uh, than the, the cost of childcare was more expensive than sending a, child, a, a younger, an older child to state uh, university. Um, that, that simply is unacceptable. Uh, you can't make ends meet uh, if those are the costs you're subject to. 
on paid sick leave. Uh, I mentioned this morning on C-SPAN that my communications director just this morning told me that her child had pink eyes. She wanted to be there for the C-SPAN um, uh, interview, but couldn't be there because her own child had pink eye. A, a, a very diffi difficult decision she had to make, but knowing that she could stay home with her child, uh, and that, that was the right decision to make. Americans today out there who agonize every day uh, whether they should go to work uh, and leave their sick child home or miss work, miss pay to take care of the, their, their sick child at home. These are ex incredibly painful decisions that have to be made. Uh, and uh, again, the president talking about uh, a much broader jobs package, not talking about a particular pipeline, but talking about all the infrastructure problems and needs that we have in our country and calling upon Congress to face that and to do something about it. So all in all, a very positive speech, a very strong speech, uh, no shrinking violet speech whatsoever. And I think uh, you know, there was unanimous uh, agreement within our, uh, within our caucus that this uh, was a very, very excellent speech by the President. Question? I believe everyone in our caucus understands the value of doing trade where we're able to send our goods to other countries and get a fair price for it and vice versa. Uh, many of us want to make sure that as we move forward, because everyone knows that we're going to have that global competition, we feel comfortable that we can win it. And with a trade deal that lets us have that fair competition, we feel very comfortable that we can win it. Unfortunately, too often what we see is that trade deals get reached and signed, but uh, those trading partners never live up to enforcing their end of the bargain. And so if you look at the bottom of a mug that when you're drinking coffee, if you probably look at that ballpoint pen that you're using to write with, uh, if you look at the coin right now, really good chance that they don't say made in America. And a lot of us believe that we have to make sure we're fighting for trade that helps America. We just finished talking about the folks that haven't benefited from this economic recovery the way they should are working class Americans who are in the middle uh, of America and earn a paycheck. And the last thing we want to do is do anything that makes it more difficult for the guy who is watching gas prices go down, which is good, but hasn't yet seen his paycheck grow in size. And so we want to make sure we have policies, including trade policies, that will go to the middle of America and say, we hear you. And so we, we believe the president is prepared to work with Congress to put forward a trade deal with whether it's with uh, the Pacific Rim countries or with it, whether it's with our friends in Europe that will actually make sure that we have smart deals that are enforceable and that will open up those markets to our manufacturers so we create good jobs here uh, at home. Uh, if, if we do that, it is a win-win to be able to have trade. And we hope that we're able to head in that direction bipartisanly with working with the president. If I, if I could just comment. I think clearly the skepticism within the Democratic caucus on trade, but I would say there's also growing skepticism within the Republican caucus on this as well. And I think the president wasn't just talking to members of Congress last night, he was speaking to the American people. And I think that's what he has to do, talking about the fact that uh, the opportunity for growth uh, in, in our trading partners, 95% of that growth is outside the United States. Uh, we simply can't just produce things and sell it to ourselves and, and expect uh, the growth in our economy. Uh, but it's about how we do that and w whether we're going to ch change the paradigm here. And as uh, the Chairman Becerra mentioned, uh, there's a great deal of skepticism within our caucus because of the lack of enforcement. Um, there has been more under this president, and we appreciate that, but I think that's something that was that's very loud and clear within our caucus. But I will say this. Uh, I'm holding my power see, you know, asking uh, members of Congress how they uh, uh, will vote on an issue you know, we've heard this over and over again on the health care debate and everything else without reading the bill. There has been no TPA forward. There's been no TPP. And that's obviously, I understand it's part of the process. It's negotiated, then brought to Congress. But asking members of Congress to vote, how they will vote on a bill before they've seen it, I, I think is wrong. I think we should all uh, have a respectful debate, uh, talk about this within our caucus, and have a debate on the floor as well when that bill is brought up and make a decision then.
two months to you know to, to fight the threat from ISIS. Uh, you know, obviously people much like the trade issue are kind of on both sides of the issue on this, and it's very hard. How do you see working with the administration, which still hasn't stepped forward? I know you're not going to speak with that for multiple times and, and getting your things worked out. So, and I think Chad, you're right. In a, in a sense, the issue on the the authorization on the use of military force is very similar to trade. You know, on, on trade, it's not as if we haven't had some experience with trade deals. So I, I think not just members of Congress, but um, the American public has a sense about trade deals. And at the same time, I think not just members of Congress, but Americans over the last 13, 14 years have gotten a sense about what it means to authorize the use of military force in foreign countries. And so it's one of those things where the American public, when they're reacting, whether it's on trade or on a, any authorization to use military force, it's not just based on some gut. It, it, it quite honestly is based on experience. Now, members in the public don't all get to vote on whether we're going to send troops abroad or whether we're going to pass a trade deal. That's, that's the privilege that we have uh, that we've been given by our constituents. But they have a sense about them. And just the way there's an apprehension in America about trade deals, because while some have seen the benefits of these trade deals, many Americans would tell you that they lost their business, they lost their job because the work went overseas. And so on the uh, authorization to use military force, I, I suspect there's almost unanimity in the Congress that the president needs to come to Congress to get that authorization. And the Congress has to act one way or the other, yay or nay. Uh, I am one who would say that on an authorization to use military force, there's a very high bar. Again, because we have experience. We've seen this. We've been there. We've done that. And if I know what the mission is, if I have a sense of how we can say we've achieved it, because I have no doubt that our men and women in uniform will achieve the goal if they're told what it is, then I will give it all due consideration. I gave the president back in September, October, I think it was, uh, the authorization he asked for temporarily to try to start the process to deal with uh, ISIL and the, the barbaric uh, groups that are out there right now killing innocent people. Uh, but it was a short timeline. It was a short leash. And so my sense is, well, we should come up here and have that discussion and a debate whether the president puts forward uh, what he would uh, ask Congress to vote on or whether we in Congress, which quite honestly, it's our responsibility to draft the authorization. I would say that one way or the other, it's got to be a clear mission. If the president expects me to give authorization to do anything with our military beyond what he's already done. I, I don't believe that you see that much daylight. I believe most people appreciate, in fact, the president said in the State of the Union very well, you, we haven't just jumped into these things reacting rashly. He's thought it through. And the result is that today, most of our combat troops are home from Afghanistan and all of our combat troops are home from Iraq. We did, our troops did what they were instructed to do. Their mission was to set up in Iraq a country that was stable enough so that the people of Iraq could prove that they wanted to be a country, a nation together. That they blew it is not our troops' fault. Unless we're going to go in there and essentially be their mommy and daddy and uh, be their nanny as they decide whether they want to be Iraqis versus Sunni or Shia or, or Kurd or whatever else. Uh, I don't think that's the, that should be the mission of our troops. And so I don't think there's a lot of daylight. The president has been very specific. He wants a clear mission. We hope that any authorization would make that very uh, transparent to everybody. There's a clear mission. I think that'll give every member a chance to be able to vote comfortably, confidently, yay or nay, on whether we should go forward. And given that the president has requested that uh, Congress consider uh, giving him the authorization, uh, I think the president's saying, Congress, we're partners in this. So 
But yay or nay is important. If you say nay, you've set the course. If you say yay, we'll fulfill the mission. Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, the president has been true to his word, ending the conflicts in, uh, in milita our military presence uh, in Iraq, now in Afghanistan. Uh, but we do have to respond to challenges when they arise. And particularly here in ISIL, the president um, has uh, said last night that he'd like an AMUF uh, to match the resolve of the men and women who are uh, overseas and our partners overseas who are fighting ISIL at this point in time. But I think uh, the chairman is right in uh, that members of Congress are looking for definition, understanding it's not open-ended. The president said that last night as well. Uh, but I think for the dignity of the, the Congress, uh, it is our responsibility and we need to hold the vote on this. Uh, regardless of how people vote, um, it, it's responsibility of Congress to do that and I think we ought to do it. You know, it's interesting is um, for quite some time, nearly half of the Congress has been ready to fix our broken immigration system with a common sense approach. Um, Senate in the last Congress passed a bill by a vast majority, bipartisanly. Uh, the House had the votes, but Republican leadership uh, refused to give members a chance to vote on the floor on that legislation. What the Republican leadership in the House and Senate will do, it's not quite clear. We do know that there is a deep desire and readiness on the part of Democrats to move forward fixing the broken immigration system. And so Republicans control this place. Uh, it's up to them to show they can lead and come up with solutions. And so we're looking forward to working with them to come up with solutions because we desperately need them when it comes to a broken immigration system. Um, the president, fortunately, took some steps administratively that aren't permanent because it was executive action, but at least helps make a broken system work a little bit better. So whatever the Republicans come up with, we'll take a close look at. We want to try to make it for us to say we've made some bipartisan progress on immigration. But at the same time, they shouldn't, they shouldn't fool, try to fool anyone. Uh, this needs a big fix. And tinkering on the edges uh, doesn't solve it. And trying to avoid dealing with the tough issues is a wimpy way to make policy in Washington, D.C. Maybe you should have said tinkering on the borders. Uh, but um, both the chairman and I were um, part of a, a meeting at the White House last week uh, from the Democratic uh, leadership and uh, our counterparts from the Republican side in both the House and the Senate and Democratic leadership as well. And at that meeting, it was remarkable uh, about the both the president and the leaders of the House and the Senate Republican caucus talked about the issues that we do agree upon. Yet here we are, I guess, in the third, going to the third week of session, and again, nothing but divisive bills, nothing that brings us together. None of the issues, whether it's cybersecurity on a, on a jobs bill, infrastructure, uh, on comprehensive uh, tax reform, the tax code, none of those issues are being debated or uh, uh, regular water through the committee. And um, so the suggestion that Maybe this is the beginning of a piecemeal approach. You know, it's a, it's a big leap for us to take when there's been no confidence building whatsoever amongst Democrats and Republicans thus far in this early stage. I would have suggested maybe if we were truly looking to be bipartisan and looking to uh, gain Democratic support uh, and confidence building to work on some of the issues that we know uh, we need to face and we can work on in a bipartisan way to build that confidence up. Yet they haven't done that. To suggest that Mr. McCall's legislation of border security is going to be that attempt is, I think, uh, many of members of our caucus are going to find that very hard to believe. You, sh you should ask them how many Democrats they've talked to in proposing er, in formulating this legislation. That'll give you a sense of how bipartisan they're truly, truly trying to be. Mike. Um, back to trade for a second, because this is an issue that's divided Democrats for part time new, but it seems especially through this year, Tom. I think because the turnover of Blake's cabinet and the negotiations that happened. 
Any trade bill always requires bipartisan support, and any trade bill always requires the administration explaining what they're planning to do. Congress has to be the one that signs the deal. Uh, the administration can negotiate a deal, but it's not until Congress says yes on the dotted line that you have a deal. And what we've seen develop over the last 20 or 30 years of trade policy is that more and more it seems like Congress is shut out of the process which means the public is shut out of the process because if we don't hear much, chances are most of the public isn't hearing much until it's already said and done. And so uh, much will depend on any success of a trade deal on how much consultation there will be with Congress and how much bipartisan effort you'll see in Congress to get a bill done because without the two of those, it makes it real difficult to move forward because the appreh apprehensions that the American people feel about trade are reflected here in Congress as well. Uh, middle class Americans have a right to know that when we do something in Washington, D.C., whether it's domestic policy or abroad, it's to make sure that we're improving the lives of American people. We got to get back into the business of rewarding hard work. And I believe too many Americans think that Washington, D.C. is divorced from that idea. Trade policy is one where folks get very apprehensive if we're going to make it possible to do a good trade deal and give people the feeling that we're working on their behalf, uh, it will be because there's been strong consultation and strong bipartisan work. As one who um, has, had, has had a mixed record on trade, uh, did not support TPA when it was proposed by President Bush, yet supported some of the trade agreements afterwards. I've, been, I've followed this issue for many, many years, well over a decade. Um, I think the observation you make that there is anxiety within the Democratic caucus, I don't think that's new. I don't think that's something new. Maybe the observation of the heightened level, that's debatable. What I do think is new, though, is the anxiety that is taking place in the Republican caucus. Uh, more and more of their members from the right-wing Tea Party who don't believe that the trade agenda is working for them, which is very interesting. Uh, I think that puts pressure on the Republicans if, if again, that they want to pass a bill. They need to start talking to Democrats we would like to see in a TPA, what it is that will make it more palatable, possibly for more Democratic support, um, and that this is not going to be rammed down the throats of the Democratic caucus. Um, this is up to them to work in a bipartisan way, and if they fail to, I think the legislation will be uh, doomed. Uh, I do think that a great deal of pressure now is on the President as well uh, to explain to the American people, if this is the agenda, why it is important for us to do this uh, and has to go into the heartland uh, as well as to cities like New York and Los Angeles to explain to a constituency, uh, his constituents, our constituents, why it's important for this legislation to pass. Any final questions? Okay, thanks all very much. Thank you all.